I have the pleasure to give the floor to Mrs. Simonson, which uh, teaches law at Brooklyn uh, Institute of Law, something like that. Yeah. And uh, wish a warm welcome to her. And uh, we have all here heard for about the criminal courts and the resistance in them. Please. Wonderful, thank you. Um, it's an honor and a pleasure to be with you all here today. Thank you for inviting me and for having me. Um, we ended the last question and answer per, uh, period talking about the theme of rethinking punishment. And uh, Ruben Miller sort of asked us to think about the relationship between the potential for abolition or getting rid of punishment and reimagining it. Um, and so my talk today, I think, flows from that, the end of that um, question and answer that we ended with, um, looking uh, at material practices, things that people are doing across the United States today, um, forms of collective resistance that have uh, risen in prominence and in number over the last decade, um, and that I think have something to show us about what it can mean to uh, rethink punishment, reimagine punishment, or radically imagine a world uh, without punishment at all. Um, so these are forms of collective resistance to the carceral state and to criminalization, uh, in which people take care of each other in material ways that live out understandings of justice that challenge the criminal system. These collective practices challenge the legal system's normative authority and they signal an ideological battle between the status quo of punishment and the radical imaginations of groups of people on the ground. So the kinds of practices that I'm gonna talk about uh, for the first part of my talk um, come in part from a book that I published last year called Radical Acts of Justice, How Ordinary People Are Dismantling Mass Incarceration. And so I'm gonna to focus today on visions of justice that are taking shape inside of criminal courthouses in the United States. So we might not think of these as the sites of punishment, uh, but there are these places that are supposed to be open to the public uh, and demonstrations of administering justice and promoting public safety. And so I'm gonna talk about uh, three different tactics, things that people are doing in criminal courthouses in the US, although I should say for all but bail funds, um, you know, and uh, here and throughout Europe as well. Um, <clears throat> these are tactics that I write about uh, because they've grown in numbers and in prominence over the last decade. Um, indeed, they've each grown exponentially in the last 10 years, uh, going from maybe one or two places to dozens, in the case of bail funds, uh, well over 100. These are practices that are often led by people who are the most directly impacted by mass criminalization. Many of them have been incarcerated or have family members or loved ones who have been criminalized. And I should say that there are also forms of resistance that I have personally been closest to and in community with. I'm not watching them from a distance. And they're something that unites them all, which is that they're intervening directly in the system as a way to both help people caught in the system and fight against the system and its very existence by undermining criminal law's stated purposes for existing at all. So I wanna talk about the ideology of criminal courts and the carceral state against which these groups are fighting uh, and then talk about what they do and how they help us uh, rethink, contrast, uh, contest these reigning ideas. Um, these pictures are of a criminal courtroom uh, in Manhattan and the Bronx County Hall of Justice. So these are two criminal uh, courthouses in New York City. Um, that's the courthouse that I practice in as a public defender down at the bottom. And in these spaces, uh, there are understandings of ideas of justice, of safety, and the people that are just taken to be the case, or at least taken to be the case by those who administer the system. The first um, we're all familiar with and have been talking about today, which is justice. Uh, and the hall of justice here would mean that justice is when 
the state prosecutes individuals for wrongful or disorderly conduct. That's what justice is. Hopefully they're guilty, hopefully the sentence is correct, uh, but that's what justice is, and that's what we do in this courthouse. The second is the idea or the ideology of public safety, which is the sort of safety that's ideally provided by police officers, by court officers, and by criminal courthouses. It's safety from individual removal from society, individual condemnation. Safety comes from state violence. And in the United States, uh, as in many places, when a politician says, I'm in favor of public safety, what that is code for is I'm in favor of more and better policing, prosecutions, and incarceration. And the third ideological concept is the language of the people, which has lots of meanings in the United States and lots of meanings here, but has a particular meaning in criminal courthouses in the US. Um, and that meaning seeps into everyday courtroom practices, written motions, case law, uh, particularly in criminal cases. Um, we often literally call prosecutors the people, right? So it might be the people of the state of Illinois versus Jocelyn Simonson if I were being prosecuted in Illinois. And then we call the individual prosecutors the people. This would be true when I practice in the Bronx. Has anyone seen the people today? And by that, they mean the individual prosecutor. And so it comes to seem natural through this language and also through the practices that it embodies, such as the idea that we have a full-throated democracy in which we elect our prosecutors. It's come to seem natural that we entrust local prosecutors to define and render justice and safety on behalf of the people or as embodying the people, as part of the public that matters. And so when the groups that, like the kinds I'm about to talk about, gather to support people accused of crimes or to resist incarceration, those groups are not part of the people that are imagined by prosecutions. They're not uh, the good people, they're not the neutral people, they're something else. They're something reactionary, biased and outside of the workings. They don't fit into the conceptions of justice, safety, or the people that the system requires uh, to, to operate. And these ideas are therefore all intertwined. Our approaches to justice and safety depend on this limited notion of which people matter. Justice means finding and punishing individuals who have committed wrongs, and prosecutors deliver public safety by removing them from society labeling them as criminal. And this is not to say that these are the only ways to understand these concepts, uh, but that within criminal courthouses, uh, these are the concepts that the court requires to maintain uh, the machinery of what's happening there. So enter forms of collective resistance, such as community bail funds, court watching and participatory defense, the three um, I'll talk about today, which, sorry, do I, no, which come to a site of domination, the criminal courthouse, and use collective action to live out alternate understandings that challenge the system. These groups are often led and made up of black women, trans people, formerly incarcerated people, non-citizens, and other people directly impacted by the system. And they commandeer the tools of the system to support people caught inside of it through otherwise routine procedural acts, such as paying bail or participating in a sentencing hearing. And when done collectively by traditionally excluded groups and in opposition to the system's dominant ideas, these communal acts raise foundational questions that call into doubt the legitim legitimacy of the system. Organizers in these efforts see justice and safety not as abstract ideas handed down by judges and prosecutors and police officers, but as living ideals that we must and can create together. So in researching and writing uh, my book and in my own uh, practices, um, I've spoken to dozens of organizers around the country, uh, easily hundreds um, over the last decade, and again and again, they've told me that they've joined in these efforts not because they wanted to create new political vistas or ideas, but because they wanted to help people in a tangible way. They wanted to do something in their own backyards or in their cities. 
And yet, again and again, uh, people have found that by engaging in these practices, their understandings of justice and safety are shaken and then rebuilt by work that they do together. So community bail funds uh, can be a useful entry point to talk about this practice uh, because they have multiplied so exponentially in the last decade in the United States. Um, in 2015, there were three operating community bail funds in the United States, and now we're at 100. By 2020, we were at well over 100. And a community bail fund is a group that pays money bail for strangers out of a broader idea of the injustice of pretrial detention. Now, I realize that money bail in the United States is its own beast, and so I'm going to talk for a minute about the process of money bail which is a central part of how we're able to hold people in pretrial detention at all in the United States. So money bail, uh, and apologies to those of you who know it, but even if you do, uh, perhaps a refresher, is meant to be a way to release someone charged with a crime while ensuring that they return to court at a future date and are not arrested for allegedly criminal conduct. The idea is that someone will return to court because they don't want the bail money that they paid or that their loved one paid or that somebody paid to be confiscated. Studies show pretty clearly that this incentive is not a thing. It's a fallacy. In practice, money bail uh, has been shown to provide little or no additional incentive to return to court or to avoid rearrest, uh, whatever that might mean. Uh, instead, when bail in any amount is set in criminal court, the reality for a poor or a working class person is that they may spend months or years enduring, enduring the violence, tedium, and isolation of jail, and, of jail that we've heard about today while waiting for their case to be resolved at very high risk of losing their jobs, their homes, and even their children while still uh, technically presumed innocent. Um, and the Constitution of the United States does have a phrase about excessive bail but courts have said this doesn't equate to a constitutional bar on having someone wait in jail while their case is pending because they can't afford the amount of bail that a judge has set in their case. And as a result, uh, at any one time in the United States, you know, again, we're doing the, the snapshot uh, um, moment right now, well over, well over 400,000 people are imprisoned in jails throughout the United States without being found guilty of anything. And uh, in most cases, the majority of those people, because bail has been set beyond an amount that they can afford, could be as little as $25 or $50 that people sit in jail for. When we think about incarceration rates, the number of people in jail in the United States, United States pre-trial has more than doubled over the past 15 years. So the graph of that would look very different than some of the graphs we've seen today. This pretrial detention is done in the name of the people. It's done in the name of the people and the name of the community. Uh, often, and under legislation state by state in the United States, literally with a finding by a judge that the people or the community are going to benefit and be safer from incarceration pretrial. And so community bail funds come in and they interrupt this process. Uh, again, in nearly 100 places around the country, Community bail or bond funds or bailouts, they come with different names, but they free people from pretrial detention on a daily basis. Some of them are rotating pools of money because if they uh, pay bail for somebody and eventually they return, then that money can be used to pay bail for something else. <clears throat> Some bailouts are related to particular populations such as uh, the Black Mama's Bailout, which has been done around the country on Mother's Day every year since 2017. Some bail funds support people that they free through finding housing services or simply helping make sure that they have transportation to get to court. Many of them uh, welcome people who they free into their organizing community, uh, finding space, uh, training, and other forms of support. Some of them keep statistics of what happens to people they free, and all of them do this work publicly, bailing out strangers and connecting the freeing of people to broader visions of community. 
of taking care of people instead of putting them in cages. They greet people who are released from jail with flowers, with offers of help, with collective care. Bail funds are not a brand new practice. Um, people have bought the freedom of their neighbors as long as we've had slavery and as long as we've had bail and jail. Uh, in more recent history, uh, in 1970, actually probably about six months before the picture that we saw of Attica earlier this afternoon, uh, in a different uh, uh, incarceration facility, the Women's House of Detention, a jail in New York City that had housed women at the time, uh, Angela Davis, and other incarcerated black and Puerto Rican women formed the Women's Bail Fund uh, from inside of jail, working with people on the outside to bail out women from jail, uh, and that continued for about two years. So it's not a brand new practice, um, but as I said, uh, it's a practice that in the last decade has seen a rebirth, a growth, um, and a lot of public attention, even if numerically the number of people who are being bailed out is not astronomical. And when these groups pay bail for a stranger, they send a powerful message to the court system. We are the community. We're a community bail fund. We are the community in whose name you, the court, have ordered detention. But we don't agree with your vision of justice. To pay money bail using an organized community bail fund becomes a collective assertion of power over a judge's decision to hold someone in a cage because of their poverty. And so bail funds, the people in the bail fund, tell us, tell the world, that incarceration doesn't make everybody feel safer, it doesn't represent all people, and that freedom can mean community safety, too. I'm going to briefly talk about court watching and participatory defense, but in a little, uh, a shorter way, and then uh, tell a story about these three tactics coming together. So in uh, Baton Rouge, Baltimore, uh, New York City, uh, and at least 30 other places, uh, court watching groups are bringing uh, ordinary people into criminal courtrooms to observe and document the so-called justice being administered in their names. These groups of court watchers, uh, which are familiar to courtrooms across Europe as well, sit in the audience section of criminal courtrooms to demonstrate support for people accused of crimes. And the presence of court watchers in the US also is secured by a constitutional right to be inside of most courtrooms. And court watchers uh, today use social media to let the public know what everyday courtrooms look like. This is not uh, Trump on trial, where everyone knows you know, every minute what's happening. These are crowded courtrooms uh, where case after case gets called, sometimes in a way that can feel tedious uh, to outsiders. Court watchers come in and they pay attention to what's happening, they decipher it, and they tell us about it. And they also often sit in courtrooms uh, visibly, wearing matching t-shirts and sending a message to the courtroom through their collective presence. Again, we are the people too. Or as uh, this um, cartoon from Court Watch New York City, uh, not in our name, right? We're the people. Stop saying it's the people of the state of New York. By telling the public about what they see, they therefore send a larger message about the violence of everyday courtroom proceedings and about the potential to look outside of the criminal courthouse uh, to find some kind of justice. Participatory defense is another growing practice, and just like court watching in bail fund, it's a kind of activity that people have always done, but that now uh, has a particular name and a particular network of grassroots organization that are engaging in it very deliberately. So uh, both of the pictures on the left there are from Knoxville, Tennessee, which would be an example of one place where there's a participatory defense hub, but there are more than 50 others operating uh, right now in the United States. Um, and with participatory defense, people directly affected by criminal cases meet regularly to support each other and to shift case outcomes away from the prison and toward uh, uh, usually uh, staying with the family in some way. And the centers of these hubs are families of people who are incarcerated or charged with crimes. Um, <clears throat> and again, pictured here is a hub from Knoxville, Tennessee, which for years has been meeting every week in a church basement 
to strategize around and intervene in individual cases, often through cre creating biographical videos or photographic essays that humanize the person charged with a crime. And as the Hub members gain expertise in criminal procedure, they start to seize control of the narrative and shift understandings about what the community thinks that justice requires, and also who the experts are inside of the courtroom. Uh, and so another example of how power can shift as people organize together to help individual people, but then also to send a larger message using the available tools um, of criminal procedure. So each of these tactics lay claim to an alternative vision of the concepts of justice, safety, and the people. And this is destabilizing to the status quo. And so it should be no surprise that system actors resist and push back against each of these tactics. Judges and prosecutors hate bail funds, court watchers, and participatory defense. And I'll say more about this repression in a minute, uh, but for much of the last decade, the repression um, would now might be something we can consider light. It would be uh, bad-mouthing the court watchers on Twitter um, or uh, issuing orders restricting who can be inside of a courtroom. Um, <clears throat> but from right away, within weeks even, of engaging in a court watching project, uh, groups can feel the resistance, and by feeling the resistance can also feel the power of what they're doing. Okay. So I'm going to tell a story from Boston, Massachusetts, uh, from November 2021 that brings together a number of these tactics uh, as an example of how this ideological fight over justice and safety can play out. Um, <clears throat> this is a story about jail court. Jail court is what it's been named by organizers and activists. So in mid-October 2021, I'm sorry, I meant to have the first the picture on the left a little more visible before the next one appeared, but uh, Hopefully you can see that picture on the left. That's, uh, that was an empty room in the local jail in Boston, Massachusetts. And in mid-October of 2021, the Boston Municipal Court, so that's the lowest level court, here's uh, uh, low-level crimes, announced a plan to address the growing numbers of unhoused people in Boston or homeless people. Um, <clears throat> and it was the city had a lot of different agencies working together on the plan. And the plan was that the court and the city would take a vacant room inside the local jail, would put an American flag inside of it, and would say, now it's a courtroom. Now it's a courtroom. In this new courtroom, officials would process the cases of people arrested after they swept homeless encampments in a particular area in the city of Boston. Uh, right in the center of the city and actually right across from the sheriff's uh, office. And this was an effort, city agencies said, to connect people with homes to mandatory drug treatment and other resources that would help them. And they located those services inside of the jail too. So they said, this is going to be really convenient. We're going to help people by prosecuting them and we're going to put it all because we have empty, empty rooms in our jail. There were no judges inside of the jail court. Uh, there was a live feed to a judge, this is hard to see, who's sitting in the actual Boston Municipal Courtroom, um, which is wooden and, and, and you know, nice, nicer. So the judge's screen uh, showed the jail court, which each unhoused person sat in handcuffs at a small table next to a lawyer, while a district attorney sat on the other side <clears throat> and two armed guards stood, wa st stood watch. So this announcement was made uh, in the end of October 2021. Oh, sorry. Imagine that you can only see the right side right now, because I want to tell you about these groups before you read the tweets. Um, <clears throat> so when we got to this month, October 2021, uh, there was already an enormous coalition of groups in Boston that were working both to help people uh, who did not have a place to live or who were using drugs and to fight against criminalization and incarceration in the state of Massachusetts. So one of them was uh, Court Watch Massachusetts. Um, <clears throat> Court Watch Massachusetts had for years been pushing back against the use of the city's criminal courts and jails 
to, quote, solve the problem of houselessness. And they'd conducted court watching efforts after a series of similar sweeps of encampments in 2019. During the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, Court Watch Massachusetts had been working alongside other groups to provide support and advocacy for people who were jailed or otherwise marginalized. And so those, those groups included the Massachusetts Bail Fund, founded in 2011, probably the longest running uh, community bail fund in the United States right now, actually, certainly, which like nearly the 100 other bail funds around the country had been posting bail for years. Um, and they began, founded by social workers, uh, aimed at just bailing out people charged with very low-level crimes for very low amounts who also had families supporting them. But by 2021, their motto was free them all. And they were trying to free as many people as they could, no matter what they were charged with, no matter who they are. And so these two groups um, organized alongside a participatory defense hub called uh, Families for Justice as Healing, which is led by and for incarcerated women. And scores of other local groups were also part of the coalition. But notice how at the center were groups that had been doing court watching, participatory defense, and operating a bail fund for years and were in community with each other. So when the jail court opened in November 2021, they were ready. They were ready. What did they do? Well, court watchers from Court Watch Massachusetts began by trying to get access to this jail court. They were let into the jail building, but put into a room next to the actual jail court where they watched on a screen the court that was happening on a screen. Um, or they were given a Zoom feed to what was happening. But they sued ahead of time and got access to what was happening. And then they live tweeted what they could see. So on the left are a few, are formerly known as tweeted what they could see. Um, and the first case, for example, was a man charged with a misdemeanor, a low-level crime of drug possession. Uh, he had been uh, sleeping in a tent in an encampment and swept uh, away by the police and brought to the jail. And the judge uh, on the screen could have legally released the man, but ordered him detained instead. Why? In part because they were already in the jail, right? It was a, it's actually the easiest thing to do in that moment. And so Court Watch Massachusetts wrote on Twitter, this means he'll likely be held overnight to undergo painful life-threatening withdrawal and be transported to criminal court tomorrow. This court was created to detain houseless people with substance use disorders and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. And they were right. By the end of the day, that same man had lost his place in a treatment facility, one that would not, not uh, connected to the criminal court system, and was sent to jail while he was in withdrawal. And this was a strategy that court watchers had been engaging in for years, live tweeting courtroom realities that would otherwise go unremarked in the public sphere, and connecting those observations to larger ideas about justice and safety, and about the actual purpose of criminal courts, right? Uh, the purpose here being to detain people rather than to help them, um, seen by court watch as an engine of injustice and a lack of safety rather than the other. And while court watchers observed and tweeted, outside of the jail building, dozens of activists and organizers gathered with signs that said things like, on these hearts, uh, stop the sweeps, close the jail court. They chanted, they protested as people entered and exited the building. They voiced support for solutions such uh, to drug use and poverty that do not involve the police or criminal courts, such as the provision of clean water, affordable and accessible housing, safe consumption sites, and voluntary treatment or harm reduction programs. And uh, most centrally, they worked to support those who came through the court and their families however they could. Whether it was the Massachusetts Bail Fund paying bail for those who were detained, or the Bail Fund and others providing transportation, cell funds, and referrals to partners for people released, referrals to services. In the local news in Boston, and this was a local story, the jail court was a story of two contrasting ideas of how to approach housing insecurity and drug use 
during the pandemic. Either criminalize it and force treatment using available space, like empty rooms in a jail, or in the alternative, allow people to stay in tents on public land while the state builds out more voluntary treatment, safe housing, and other forms of social support. These conflicting understandings of health and safety were summed up uh, by one sign, um, which then be this sign became included in news stories. Uh, it says, a tent is safer than your jail. A tent is safer than your jail. And so through a combination of collective tactics, court watching, paying bail, participatory defense, and then taking this larger message to the media, this coalition waged an ideological battle over the meaning of safety in the context of just one small inaccessible room in a jailhouse. And it worked. Uh, 18 days later, the Chief Justice of the Boston Municipal Court signed an order officially ending the jail court. And during those 18 days, the court only heard 17 cases, and that was the official reason given for why this court that had been billed as something that was going to be uh, indefinite ended. But the organizers and coalition members experienced this as a victory. They saw officials struggle to respond to reporters' questions, and they felt that they had brought public attention to the relationship between houselessness and criminalization. More pointedly, these groups had exposed the hypocrisy of a liberal city's attempting a so-called humanitarian approach to clearing a tent encampment, while in reality using the same old tools and spaces of the criminal system to do these humanitarian things. In doing this work, Court Watch Massachusetts and his sister groups were resisting the criminal system while they engaged with it. They were helping people materially while simultaneously holding out an alternative conception of what justice and safety can look like by living it out, by supporting people. And this battle of ideas does not and cannot come just from protests and signs, although they're a part of it. But a sign saying a tent is safer than your jail articulates the ideological fight. And then a public conversation about the meanings and justice and safety happens only when there's been collective action around these ideas over time. Had this broad coalition not already been in community, they wouldn't have been ready to counter what, they, uh, what would otherwise have been an uncontroversial set of news stories about a new humanitarian jail that was giving people treatment uh, after they were swept from a homeless encampment. In my own research and writing about the power and growth of each of these tactics, community bail funds, court watching, participatory and collective defense, um, a lot of the organizers who I spoke to uh, tell me, I'd say most have told me, that they didn't jump into this work because they wanted to tear down the criminal system. But that in doing this work, again, freeing people again and again and again and seeing the system uh, try to stop that freedom, or trying to show somebody's humanity again and again and seeing a judge really not want to hear that or see the video, um, they came to collectively believe that justice could not be served in these places. <clears throat> uh, and so through this collective work, uh, largely done over the last 10 years, uh, most of the people involved in these efforts have come to identify as abolitionists rather than joining the efforts for that reason. Uh, in the words of Mary Hooks, who's a black feminist organizer in Georgia and one of the leaders of Black Mama's bailouts, um, they were transformed in the service of the work. Sorry. Don't want that yet. Okay. So these groups together take individual struggles and they use them to build power toward bigger fights. Um, it's not just uh, this one moment. And in fact, this one moment in Boston was just one moment. That fight continues. Then a new mayor came to town and she started doing the same thing as well, but using different language. This coalition is still fighting it. Uh, but it's not that this, bat this war was won and they're ready in Boston to never criminalize poverty again. It's far from that. But the fight is on. And groups that are engaging in these tactics around the United States are engaging in these bigger fights in all kinds of ways. 
Um, some of them are organizing for legislation to uh, decarcerate or to end money bail. Um, and actually in Illinois, there was a big win where the local bail fund was a, if not the central player in the passage of a law to abolish money bond altogether in the state. Uh, these groups engage in educational campaigns around the racist history of policing in prisons. They write reports about reducing law enforcement budgets and funding community services like health care, housing, and job training. And so in doing all of this, they lay out connections between different forms of state violence by telling the stories of those of them uh, who themselves or through people that they've been uh, supporting have experienced the violence of the state that was supposed to be in the name of safety. And they show us that there are other ways to live out democracy and to live out safety. And I know that this, especially in the short version, probably sounds like a rosy account of collective resistance. And I don't mean to argue that it's the solution or even that the work is easy and always successful even in the, in the, you know, the sense that I've said. Um, whether or not it feels successful, too, the work is tiring. It requires time and labor and money, any of which can dry up at any moment. Um, and indeed, a number of bail funds have halted operations or switched gears in their organizing for some or all of those reasons. And as with all forms of resistance against the status quo, this work of collective care is constantly subject to backlash and retrenchment. And so I want to return to this backlash for a moment, actually not uh, as a message of pessimism, but as a demonstration of just how powerful uh, these tactics can be. So each uh, form of contestation that I've uh, talked about has experienced substantial backlash from elites in control of the criminal system. And it's not just prosecutors, public defenders have pushed back against participatory defense, for example. Court watching groups and participatory defense hubs have been forced out of courthouses despite uh, pretty clear constitutional rights to be there. And judges, prosecutors, and police officers have, as I said before, never liked bail funds, often made efforts to shut them down. But I finished writing my book um, uh, at the beginning of 2023, and I had a chapter about repression and retrenchment and all of these things, and I couldn't even imagine, actually, the repression against bail funds that's occurred in the last year. So I just want to name that uh, to talk about the moment we're in. Um, so in just the last year, uh, we have seen, when it comes to community bail funds in the United States, arrests of bail fund organizers for the acts of posting bail. So this happened in Atlanta, where the Atlanta Solidarity Fund is a longstanding bail fund that pays bail for protesters. And uh, as part of the movement to stop Cop City uh, in Georgia, <clears throat> we can talk about that in Q&A if anyone wants to, um, they were arrested and charged with money laundering for the act of posting bail. I, not that we, I think these charges are going to brilliantly stick when it comes to trial, but they were arrested for it. In six different states, there are or probably will be in the coming months laws that outlaw or curtail the work of bail funds in substantial ways. Um, Indiana was the first state to do this. Uh, other states are following suit. Um, <clears throat> and uh, just last week, a law was passed in Georgia to curtail the use of bail funds. And among other things, it created, it didn't just say you can't have a community bail fund. It said it will be a crime if you act like a community bail fund, which for them means posting bail for, for people more than three times a year. So this statute is now creating a crime the Emanuel Baptist Church in Atlanta, where Martin Luther King Jr. was a pastor, uh, regularly collects money into a bail fund to pay bail for, their, uh, for people in their congregation and their community. That is now a crime. People who have uh, four children or cousins and want to pay bail for all of them over the course of a year, it would be a crime to do so. Uh, but the reason the legislation is there is to take aim at the power of bail funds. And these forms um, of backlash and retrenchment are, yes, dispiriting, 
they're debilitating, and they're also materially going to lead to more people being criminalized and incarcerated. But they're also an indication about the terrain of ideological struggle, that it's shifting, that bail funds have become an existential point of danger to certain parts of the system. And the power of their work comes from their invocations of social, legal, and constitutional concepts that can undermine the system's own invocations of those same ideas. And so from the work of bail funds, bailouts, court watchers, et cetera, we can draw out complex, grounded ideas about justice, safety, and fairness. And these are ideas that only emerge through collective care. They can't just be said, they have to be lived out and then said out loud. And they only come to seem possible through struggle. A bail fund engages in small moments of resistance, right? Paying bail for one person. But when it's done again and again, apparently more than three times would be our legal definition, it swells to something bigger. And so a bail fund or a bailout is showing us how we might begin to envision a different set of rules and systems, a different relationship to the state, and a different understanding of where to locate justice and safety. Right? It is the group of people waiting with flowers outside of a jail to welcome a mother home rather than the criminal courtroom that sent her to jail. And these practices of collective resistance are sometimes described as prefigurative because the actors involved are working communally to live out a vision of a society that does not yet exist. By acting out and experiencing alternative forms of justice, they're showing themselves and others that such forms are possible. And in the United States, when people talk about abolition and prefiguration and people living out alternatives, they're actually usually not in their heads starting out by thinking about community bail funds, court watching, and participatory defense. They're often thinking about forms of transformative or restorative justice that are happening outside of the state, um, or forms of violence prevention, like we talked a little bit about earlier, that are happening uh, outside of the criminal system. <clears throat> but these interventions inside the system can be forms of abolitionist prefiguration, too. Um, so uh, Judith Resnick earlier implored us to think about how we're all in this together. Uh, Ruben Miller discussed the idea of how criminality can actually be traced back to the othering of strangers. And so for it to see humanity uh, is itself a form, uh, is another way, a form of, of change and moving forward. And the practices that I've talked about today uh, show love for strangers. I do think it's love, uh, which on its own is a challenge to our individualized system of criminal punishment, right? Which is about punishing individuals rather than collective love. Um, if we go back to the beginning of the day, uh, we had this question about whether there's been a failure of imagination when it comes uh, to punishment. Um, and so I've brought in these stories today out of a belief that collective resistance from below is the kind of thing that can spark our imaginations, not because they are the answer to the question of, of what we should do when there's harm, but that they can help us reimagine or see a horizon of justice, safety, community, and love that doesn't involve punishment, that's outside of, of what the system we have now is. Thank you, I will end there.